What's up guys? Welcome back and today we're going to be doing selection sort. This is a continuation of the current sorting algorithm series that we have um, and it's the second sorting algorithm that we're going to discuss. We previously discussed bubble sort and if you haven't checked it out I would highly recommend doing that before you jump to selection sort because selection sort is just a minor tweak away from bubble sort. That's all it is. It's a minor tweak that in the average case allows selection sort to be more efficient than bubble sort. So let's walk through the logic real quick and understand what we are dealing with and we'll jump into the code implementation right after that. Let's go. So let's begin by understanding selection sort conceptually, right? We walk through this test array right here, sort it using selection sort and then implement the code right after that. So how this works is that the cool thing about selection sort is it's very similar to bubble sort. All selection sort does is that it iterates through the list, finds the smallest element and puts it in its rightful position. And it keeps doing that until the entire list is sorted. Now why I'm saying it, it puts it in the rightful place is because you could be sorting the list in ascending or descending order. So we're going to, for this tutorial, be sorting our list in ascending order. So let's begin with this. All selection sort does is it starts from the beginning of the list and assigns the first element's position as the minimum. Why we do this is because once we have this as the minimum, we go through each and every other element present in the list and compare it with our current minimum. We check to see, is three smaller than two? No, it's not, so, well, two should be the minimum. So we now reassign the minimum index to be the position at two. Then we go to the next element, we're like, is 9 less than 2? No, it's not. The next one, is 1 less than 2? Yes, it is. So clearly, in this iteration of the list, the minimum index and minimum value is at index 3, which is the value 1. And at that point, what happens is that because we're sorting this in ascending order, we know that the smallest element's rightful position is the first element. And so we simply just swap the first element with the minimum index, the value at the minimum index that we found. And so after the first iteration of the algorithm, we will essentially have one in its rightful place, followed by two, followed by nine, and three and one got swapped. So three is now in one's previous position. As simple as that. That is only the first iteration. On the second iteration, we know now for a fact that this part of the list is sorted. We don't need to really touch this. So we begin with the smaller subsection of the list and we assign this to be the new index, minimum index of the list. We compare it with every other element in the array. Is nine less than two? No, it's not. Is three less than two? No, it's not. So, well, two in fact is the value at kind of uh, the minimum index position in the array. And so after this iteration of the list, one remains where it was, two remains in its rightful place, and then we have nine and three. However, this time we know for sure that this is the sorted part of the list. And so our work over here is already done. We need not touch this bit. And subsequently, in the next round, the only part of the list we care about is these last two elements right here. So we start from the beginning and we assign minimum to be at uh, the value at index two, which is nine. And we compare it to every other value the remaining in the list. Is three less than nine? Yes, it is. So clearly, this should be the minimum. And we don't have any other values in this array, so the loop is over and now we know after this round that we have one here, two here, so three gets swapped with nine and nine comes into three's position. And now since we only have one element left, this in list is basically sorted. So now we're gonna write the code for selection sort and we know that we're going to have to iterate through the list so let's begin with our trusty for loops. Let's have an outer loop which begins with uh, element uh, variable i that we initialize to zero. 
we'll have i go to n minus 1 and I'll explain that to you just in a second while we're doing that. Now, we know from the code, the walkthrough that we did with the temp list that every time we begin with the unsorted list, we assign the first index or the first element to be the min, right? The unsorted list, which is over here represented in red, keeps decreasing in size over time once we keep putting the rightful elements in their position. But we start off by assigning the first um, value at the first index of the unsorted list to be the min. So we can kind of intuitively think of having our outer loop being that initializer for the minimum value. So we can begin by initializing the min variable to be equal to i. All right, then once we have a min, so if this is the list that we're going through and we, this is our minimum value, we have to iterate through the rest of the list to make sure that the min we have is correct. And if not, we have to reassign the min to be what the lesser value is, right? So we can think of having another for loop inside as well, which goes through the entire list. And we can start off by initializing J. And we don't want to start off just from the first value itself. We want to start off from the value which is to the right of i, right? Because i starts as the min index, and then we want to iterate through the rest of the list. i starts as the min index, then we want to iterate through the rest of the list, so on and so forth. And that's why we initialize i to j to be i plus one. And that's why we have i going to n minus one, because if i, say, is the last element, we don't want j to be initialized as the value over here which is non-existent because then we'll get an index out of bounds error. So j is initialized to i plus one. We want it to go through the entire list. And so there we have that. Once we have, the, we have this inner loop and we're going through each value, what do we want to do? We want to compare the value at index min to every other value to make sure that the value at index min is the smallest. If not, we swap. So that's as simple as saying, if array at whatever the j is, because j keeps changing, the value over here is less than the value at index min. Because this is supposed to be our uh, the value at the index, which is the smallest. So if this is less, so that means j is lesser than the value that is stored at index min, and we need to reassign index min to be j. And that's all we're gonna do over here, is reassign the min to be j. And keep in mind, j is just an index, so is min. Once we have that, and we go through iterating through the entire list, which is what this inner loop is for. Once we come out of that and we are here, we, will, we know for a fact that the min variable at this point is the smallest, uh, is the index of the smallest uh, value at the array for the unsorted list that we are going through. And so it's as simple as saying that we have the min and we want to put it in its rightful position, which is at i. So, this takes us back to the same swap that we did in bubble sort as well, except now we're doing this outside the loop. And so we can assign temp to be array at i, and then array at i to be equal to um, the value at min, right? So we're just swapping them. And then the value at index min uh, will be 10. And there we have it. This is all that you need to implement selection sort. The only other thing that we can do to make it more efficient over here is that if you remember from this example, when we had assigned this two to be the min, in this case two was already in its rightful position because we're now going through and finding the minimum in this part of the list, which is the unsorted part, depicted in red, and two is already in the rightful position. 
If we are walking through this code, we will assign min to be equal to i, and i over here is 1 because that's the index. We will go through this entire loop. We will walk through 9 and 3. None of them are smaller than 2. And so we come out over here with min equal to i, and we swap it. But what are we swapping? 2 is already at its rightful position. So the only improvement that we can make over here, although it's a small one, but all of these small things improve efficiency, and it's nice to at least know it, is we can just have an if statement that's checking if min is not equal to i, then we go ahead and run the swap kind of these three lines of code which swap the values because if min is already equal to i then we don't really need to swap anything everything is in its rightful position so there you have it this is selection sort um, the only reason this is more efficient on an average case than bubble sort is because if you go back to the bubble sort video and you check the algorithm you realize that this swap these three lines of code that is swapping was happening inside the inner loop and so every time we found a smaller value, we kept swapping, we kept swapping. And that's why we got that illusion of bubbling down or bubbling up, right? So what we did in this case was that instead of going through these three lines of code to keep swapping elements, we just assigned a new variable. And every time we found a smaller value, instead of swapping, we just reassigned it to its index, its correct index. And once we were out of the inner loop, we just did a swap. So in totality, the total number of swaps that occur in selection sort are far fewer than in bubble sort. And that's what makes it more efficient because we have to do lesser computation of these three lines versus of just this. Quick note over here, selection sort is not a stable sorting algorithm. What is a stable sorting algorithm? Well, it's one that keeps the relative order of the list intact. Let me explain with an example. Say we had a list with the values four, three, four, and one. After the first iteration or first pass using selection sort, the resulting list would be four, three, four, and four. This one would get swapped and this four would come in its position. What now happens is that when we initially got this list, this four was before this particular four. However, after using selection sort, now in the relative order, this four ends up being after it. And this might not be something you want based on the circumstance that you're dealing with because in the real world, well, this could be a list of kind of associated with different names and, you know, maybe this is already sorted by another uh, value that we can't really, we don't really know right now and we would want that um, value, that sort value to stay intact and so we would want Joe to be before Bill and in that case, if we just wanted to sort by their index IDs while keeping that relative order in place, we would want to use a stable sorting algorithm. Selection sort can also be made stable. It's simply by every time you find a minimum index, you just plug it into the front of the list. It's a little, it makes it less efficient. Uh, it's better if you're using linked lists uh, and you can look into that. But uh, yeah, thought this is something important to know because when comparing selection sort and bubble sort, since those are the two, um, you know, they're very identical to each other, uh, bubble sort is stable, selection sort is not. Let's prove the time complexity of selection sort. So intuitively we know this is very similar to bubble sort. There are two loops that go till n and this should be about n square time complexity. And let's prove that. The outer loop goes n times, right? This is just some constant operation. The inner loop starts going n minus, by the first time it runs, it goes n minus one times, then n minus two times, and then so on and so forth, till it just hits one. This can also be written as, if you reverse this order, as one plus two plus three, all the way till n minus one. This will be the total number of iterations. And since this takes into account the outer loop, because j is dependent on i, this is nothing but a simple arithmetic series, which can be written as i is equal to one, to n minus one, i, the closed form equation for this. This simply represents this arithmetic series. The closed form equation for this is n times n plus one by two. If you plug your n over here, which is n minus one, we will get 
n times n minus 1, which will give us O of n squared. So this is the big O, and this is also the omega and the theta. So in the best average and worst case scenarios, selection sort will always perform big O of n squared, or I guess theta of n squared. All right, there you have it guys. We've just finished selection sort. We talked about the concept, we wrote the code, we proved the time complexity, we spoke about stability. So that's all you need to know, everything about selection sort. And uh, if you liked it, give this video a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, give it a thumbs down. You know, I'm all about honest feedback. Write in the comments what you liked or you didn't like, what you would like to see improve in the next video, any new topics you'd like to see covered in the video. You know, I'm going to walk through all of them and you know, just say hi. Uh, thank you for watching this video and uh, I'll see you guys next time.